Hey, what's going on, party people? It is BQ here with the Impact Lounge. Impact Wrestling Redemption Review. This past Sunday was the Impact Redemption pay-per-view, and they put on a pretty good damn show, if I do say so myself. In the place to be, as always, I've got Ro, and I've also got my man Charles. Um, Charles is going to be a part of the team. He's going to be reviewing the One Night Only and Twitch shows. And I'll be stepping down from that, and he's going to do a real good job with that. So, Charles, what's up, man? Welcome to the team. Thanks a lot, BQ. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Ro. Thanks for being, letting me be a part of the team. You know, um, we always have great insight, and uh, we always keep it real about Impact Wrestling and what we see. And that's one thing I love about the Impact Lounge and you guys as a whole. And um, I just want us to keep on going with that, you know, give you some of that relief because you're a busy man like a lot of us are. And I just want us to give the best product to the people, to the fans, because that's what it's all about. Hell yeah, absolutely. Why don't you tell us about your group on Facebook real quick, man, before we get into redemption? All right, guys, we got a Impact Fan Nation is what we're called. You know, we're um, a group that does more than just give news because every group in their mother's group wants to just give out Impact News, Impact News. But we try, you know, we do the live commentary during Impact. Um, we also put the, the Impact Lines. We upload all the great stuff from here from the Impact Lounge. Uh, we definitely have uh, fantasy. Uh, we have comprehensive uh, conversations about what things going on. I mean, it's just a great place to be. We're also on Twitter at the Impact Fan Nation as well. And you can go on Facebook and check out uh, the link to get on Twitter, or you could also go on Twitter to check out the link to Facebook either way. But get on there. Uh, BQ's on there. He gives us two cents because, you know, he's great. So why not? It makes sense. Just makes all the sense in the world. And just check us out. Hell to the yeah. Ro, what's up with you, man? Uh, you avoiding all these spoilers this week for Impact? I've been trying, man. But you know, with social media, especially since I'm a big uh, basketball fan, I've been trying to keep up with what's going on. And unfortunately, people liking stuff that's been spoiled. So I've seen a couple things, but it doesn't deter me from looking forward to these next set of tapings. I heard there's some people tagging me in their spoilers. Stop that. Stop that shit. So I have I don't like <laughs> I, I try not to log on Twitter at all now during the tapings cuz it's it's out of control on Twitter. Facebook is I don't know. I, I think on Facebook more people are, are respectful. I mean, there's still people who do it, but you know, ad, admins like Charles, you know, like to put it out there like do not post spoilers in here and all that crap, but um Hopefully we can get minimal spoilers um, going forward. So let's talk. Let's talk redemption. They put on a pretty damn good show this week. Um, I haven't seen too much negative about it. I think I think Bully Ray tried to say, eh, had a couple good matches. That was about it. Uh, definitely disagree with it. I don't think it was a ten out of ten show by any stretch of the imagination. But I thought they put on a pretty good show. Um, Charles, what was your overall thoughts on, on the pay-per-view? We're going to break down the matches and stuff, but what what do you think as a whole? I think that the pay-per-view was uh, definitely lived up to the name that it was named, Redemption, because this was kind of a, a pay-per-view where they had to go all in and, and give fans a reason to come back, the ones that have left the company and left the brand, and for new fans to come in, because it was really smart with the uh, partnership with Lucha Underground. Bring those fans over if you can. And when you put on a kick-ass show, you know, at least something that's a 7 or 8 on a ten scale of 10, you can you, you can start towards that trend. I think it was a good show, just like you said. It wasn't a 10 out of 10. It wasn't a 9 out of 10. It takes a whole lot for that. It takes production. It takes him in ring things. It takes storylines going well. It takes finishes that, that make sense. You know, it takes all those things to make a good wrestling show. But I... I mean, you know, a great one. It's excellent 9 or 10. But this was a good, solid show. And um, definitely going in the right direction with the because you know this was supposed to be you know it was said to be the start of the new era the official start and i believe it was a hell of a kickoff ro what do you got on it as a whole i feel it made the statement that it needed to make i mean like you guys said i mean it wasn't no 10 out of 10 if i had to give it a rating i thought it was an eight because essentially you're looking at this pay-per-view it wasn't like the Slammiversary or the Bound for Glory since those are like the big company pay-per-views but it made the statement that it needed to make and now moving forward and even them pro uh, promoting Slammiversary I think that's gonna have even more of a viewership for that event based off of this one so Ro and I already talked about this I'm gonna ask your opinion Charles do you did you feel like looking at the pay-per-view that the crowd looked no bigger than a typical impact taping 
I, I could be totally wrong, but I I just didn't feel like so I've been to Slam Aversaries and Bound for Glories and they usually hit capacity of about eleven hundred people. I didn't feel that was the case this time. I felt like it was uh pretty close to what we see with impact. Did you feel that way or did you think it looked like more people? That is one thing that I actually looked out for specifically before the event started. Just being honest, um, it looks like the lighting was better, therefore, that you could see more people. I think it was about probably the same amount of people, maybe more. But I think they kind of tried to fool the fans at home by giving better lighting. Because, you know, we all know at the Impact tapings that the lighting kind of, when there's like not as many people in the crowd, they kind of dim the lights. So we can't really see that. And I'm just feeling like they gave us more to see being that, you know, they had a packed crowd, you know, in regards to the arena. And it, it was live. You know, it, the crowd was in it. It was lively. So that's what I think more so about it. I, I kind of go agree with you, BQ, on that, that I don't think it was more people. But I think they kind of gave us like a visual effect that made it seem like there was more people. Yeah, and I think it was a it was a hotter crowd than normally, too. So I think there was probably more wrestling fans. And, you know, I try to tell people, too, even if there are tourists that doesn't necessarily mean they're not wrestling fans and, and uh people try to categorize a tourist as some non-wrestling fan and that's not you know not necessarily the case but getting into the card itself the opening match was aerostar and drago and i kind of went on record and saying i was concerned this match was going to like steal the show even impact said this match could steal the show and i was i felt like they were going to put on an ex like an exhibition like a I don't want to say like Osprey and Ricochet, but it just I felt like it was going to be like this exhibition that they weren't going to be able to like really follow up on with the other matches. But for me, the match was OK. Uh, I actually didn't see the finish. Um, kind of had a problem with my stream for a second and the match was over. Uh, but I thought it was OK. Um, Ro, you, you're the one that texted me. Oh, uh, Drago slipped, not Drago, but Aerostar slipped a couple times. So what do you think about this one? And then... Uh, Elaborate on the slipping uh, or the botching, whatever you want to call it, because I, honest to God, didn't see it. As far as the match, I mean, we, you know, I thought this was going to be the one that I don't want to say so much set the tone, but, you know, if they really went all balls out, that, you know, would the other matches be able to live up? And I feel that this was solid. You know, it was nothing too spectacular. And for me, I'm unfamiliar with. I mean, I'm familiar with some with Drago, but not so much Aerostar, so it was kind of, like, foreign to me. But it was solid. And the botches, I don't want to say it took away from the match because it's for some reason, and I remember this at Slammiversary, it's something with that rope on the, I want to say the north, uh, uh, east, east side, east-west side, where the guys have trouble. But mainly in this match, um, Aerostar had went, for some move, uh, some springboard move, and he slipped, but he uh, fell on his feet, so he was fine. And then when he went for the finish, he went for a springboard, a spring, yeah, springboard, a uh, co code breaker, and he slipped, but he was able to hit it. And it was funny because Cyrus kept playing it off that uh, <laughs> he had tweaked his knee, but it was some he had slipped off the rope. He was able to hit the move, but he didn't really get all of it. I, I feel a lot like UBQ. I feel like it was okay. And it's simply for, for this reason. Um, I'm sure that you probably all may, may have noticed it too. It seems like um, they paused a lot, like they were waiting for one another quite a bit in the match. Like, um, just making a joke with my lady because we watched it together. I was like, are, one, are they high or something? Because <laughs> it, it, it was like, if you go back and look at it closely, you'll see it. there were times where they had stopped and like drag a weight for Aerostar to turn around. And it like it was choreographed and, and that kind of threw me off because um, there were lots of high spots. And of course, what you should expect from the two, I'm familiar with the both of them because I watch Lucha Underground and I try to watch Triple A when I can. Um, and that was what kind of my, my, my um, dig on it. It was still a good match. I wouldn't write home to mom about it, anything like that. But at the same time, I was kind of glad that it wasn't like this big five star match because like you said it was set a tone that more than likely the rest of the pay-per-view can't hold up to with the likes of the tag team match with eli drake and scott steiner and um and then maybe a slower match like your knockouts matches so i was fine with it as long as it was a good match to set up something and not garbage then it was okay and I, you know i was satisfied with it like the botch um like Ro said it didn't really take away from the match but of course you always want something that's more clean 
I, I expected a very fluid match because that's one thing with a lot of the Lucha Underground work. For the most part, it's always really, really fluid. They don't they they do a lot of crazy spots, dives, flips, whatever you want to call it, and they usually nail it spot on. So um, I was expecting that that kind of precision with this one, but the crowd was into it, and I think it served its purpose, and it got it got the show off on the right foot. And it was a good way to showcase Lucha Underground. Although, although I would have preferred they tagged them up against the uh, Cult of Lee or something like that. Kind of done, you know, followed the Impact versus Lucha Underground theme a little bit. But this this was good for what it was. So after this match, Aerostar gets the win. We get um, Josh Matthews basically telling Matt Seidel, like, I have taught you everything I could teach you. Uh, young Grasshopper, go do your thing now. Um and this actually kind of bothered me because I just I did a whole different upload on this. So I don't want I'm not going to get in my opinion too much because I haven't uploaded that. But they have this storyline, never fully committed to it, and then all of a sudden, done. So um, what did you what you got on? I'm going to um, ask Charles real quick. What did you think about that? Because I don't know how I know how Rowan and I have felt about this, but did you feel also? Like it was the storyline was lacking, like a real commitment. One hundred percent. It seems like it's something that they came up with at the last minute. Maybe like, okay, we haven't figured out who um, the spiritual advisor is going to be, so let's throw Josh in the mix. You know, it kind of has that feel to it because, like you said, they're abandoning it just out of nowhere, and it's it's been short lived. It's not like it's been long storyline, and it's not like it's caught on with people. And like the heel turn of Matt Seidel, if that's what you want to call it, it's been kind of odd. It, I mean, can you agree with that? It's been like a really odd ass heel turn because he's, I don't even know if you want to call him a tweener. It's just really weird, that, you know, in the status when it comes to his alignment that Impact has him at, uh, at right now. So, but yeah, I totally agree with you all. Um, for to try to push this on us and then it just abandoned uh, out of nowhere with really no explanation because um, it, it just, I'm hoping that something comes out of it and maybe we get a reasoning, get some reason, you know, with the next set of tapings. And it's not just something they just, just drop like, you know, the old TNA of, uh, in the past. They drop a storyline, don't give us a reason why, and act like it's never supposed to happen, not supposed to happen. So I had said in our preview show that I was hoping they were going to take the next step, and they did the exact opposite of that. Ro, you got anything on that? It just seems like they felt it wasn't going anywhere, at least on Josh Matthews' end. So they just decided to scrap him out because at least with Seidel's, you started to see slowly kind of the slow hill turn. Like Charles was saying, you know, it seemed odd at first, but I had felt that Seidel was a little bit more committed to it than uh, Josh Matthews was. So it just seemed like they decided, hey, this isn't working with him. Let's just scrap it completely. So next match of the evening was the Impact Tag Team title match. Actually, actually, before that happened, um, LAX was at the clubhouse, found out Conan wasn't there. They get a call from King and lets him know Conan isn't going to be there. He was kidnapped. Very similar to the situation where they had the tag team match at Bound for Glory with OVE and they jumped homicide before beforehand. So, you know, basically, basically same exact thing. But this time it was with uh, Conan. So... Um, Impact Tag Team title match LAX took on Eli Drake and Scott Steiner so the narrative was that Conan was not at ringside so they didn't quite have their guidance uh, the, the guy who's their voice of reason and um, I, first of all I want to say about this I actually thought Scott Steiner looked pretty good for his age in this and um, you know a lot of people are saying oh well, he really looked his age and he looked he looked old he looked slow like I actually thought for what it was, he did pretty good. In the beginning of the match, he actually kind of held it down for himself for a while. Like it was one of those matches where he figured Eli Drake was going to do a majority of the work. And in the beginning, Steiner was out there and he was definitely doing his thing. He did that Steiner um, Frankensteiner from the top rope, and I was very disappointed. I liked the the spot. I popped for it at home. I was very disappointed. There was a good portion of the crowd that stood and watched like that was some everyday shit. So if you're watching the TV, the right side is, you know, the center to the right. They're jumping up and down, hands up. Oh, my God. And then 
the the center to the left, some of the people who had the bunny ears on and stuff, they stood there like like nothing happened. And I, I, I don't know if I can wrap my head around that. I go to a lot of wrestling shows, and I always at least clap with my appreciation towards stuff. I, I cannot wrap my head around just watching Scott Steiner do a f- top rope Frankensteiner and just standing there. That makes absolutely no sense to me. Ro, what do you got on the tag team title match? Did you think everyone flowed together fairly well? Because this was two totally different dynamics. Usually we're used to seeing LAX work with people similar to their style. And now you got a, you know, kind of a big old slow Scott Steiner. Then Eli Drake, who can pretty much work with anybody at this point. But uh, what do you got on it? Yeah, before I give my take, I think, well, you know, when you're talking about probably the the non-reaction to Steiner's Frankensteiner, I think you got to realize, like, I think all of us were around the same age where seeing a guy of his size, even when you think about when he was in his prime, seeing a guy his size doing a move like that was just so crazy because we're accustomed to luchadors doing the ranas and whatnot where nowadays anybody can pretty much do it you think about a couple weeks ago you had cage doing ranas and whatnot but as far as the match um i was impressed just because i was afraid that it was going to be one of these situations and we've seen this in wrestling where you have an older vet and the other wrestlers kind of oversell for him so he get you know that wrestler gets all their offense in doesn't take any bumps so it becomes one-sided but i thought it was fine steiner did did enough and you know eli's eli and um yeah i i, I was happy for, with the change because i feel like lax got a little bit stale not not their faults i mean they've run through everyone so you know give it give them some time to chase after the belts i like the match you know I was feeling like BQ that I was afraid that Eli Drake may end up carrying the match, at least on his side of the tag team match, but it wasn't like that. Like you said, I was impressed that Scott Steiner was able to hold his own at that age to actually be able to keep up with the speed. Of course, it wasn't the speed of LAX, but for him to be able to keep up with the speed of a normal match of this day and time, because, you know, we all got to admit today's matches are more sped up than what they were back in the day. So, for him to be able to not look like he was struggling and barreling through the match was impressive in itself. Like you said, I popped too. When he did that top rope Frankenstein that I hadn't seen him do in years, I felt like a kid again. I felt like I was at the WCW arena back home in Atlanta, Georgia at the Omni. And it was great, you know. And um, that I don't, I heard uh, you still got it clap uh, chant from some of the crowd. I wish it would have gathered and gotten larger. So I'm pretty sure the people in the middle with the bunny ears were the ones that didn't join in on the fun. But um, I don't really have any um, – I don't have a problem with this match. I, for Like I said, I, I was so impressed with Scott Steiner, and I'm actually surprised they, they came out with the win, you know, and because I didn't think that Scott Steiner – because I have to keep Scott Steiner around at least for maybe a, a taping. I wasn't expecting – I was expecting to be like a one-off thing. So I'm intrigued to see – how things go forward with Eli Drake and Scott Steiner as tag team champions and what the, um, you know, how LAX will come back for from it, because you got to know that this storyline with King and uh, Conan being jumped on before the match has to produce something. And the way that Don Callis and Scott Dean Moore are presenting these storylines and carrying on with these things, it has been great and it's been intriguing. So it's got my lips wet. We got a good match. You know, we got a, a surprise ending and we got something to look forward to. This is the kind of thing you want when they say that you have a pay-per-view moving into the next uh, next era. And this is exactly what you look for. Ro, were you shocked by the finish on this one? No, not at all. I had thought they were going to win. I just didn't know because I, I even had the idea when they had when they were talking about Conan being knocked out. But I thought that that was a creative way to have them lose where you have Santana or Ortiz. I'm sorry, I get those confused. Which one is the one, the non-Afro one? Is that Santana? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I get them confused. But to have him lose his focus just because he's so accustomed to having Conan there and for Eli to capitalize on it, I thought that was a nice way, a nice way to finish the match. And I thought it was just something different. I mean, you, you look at a guy like Scott Steiner, part-timer, and you can't really bring Scott Steiner in a third time if they don't get this win because he lost at Slammiversary. So Scott Steiner is now is no longer that intimidating dude if he's lost, if he's 0-2 a pay-per-view. So I was cool with it, and I can't wait to see 
what they do forward because it was it was one of the shockers of the evening. After that, we got Ishimori versus Desmond Xavier versus El Hijo del Fantasma versus Cage versus DJZ versus Trevor Lee. So this is a random six-way match. We're always going to see something like this on an Impact pay-per-view. And it's so funny because Desmond Xavier wasn't even at the tapings, nor was DJZ. So it's it's funny that they end up getting a, a pay-per-view match. But I thought this match was really, really good. Uh, it, it was just it was just a fun match. It was a good placement, you know. After you get something, you know, that a little more storyline driven, has a shocker ending, you get something like this, and it's it's just fun. And I think they did a really good thing with making it lucha rules instead of just doing a random six way match where it's a car crash type of match and everyone's just jumping all over the place and doing flips and everything. People still got their shit in, but overall the the everything made a little bit more sense because it was you know one on one for the most part. And it, I can't think of anyone. Actually, I can't. I can't say that. A lot of people said Desmond Xavier or DJ Z would win, but um, <laughs> I think the safe money was on Brian Cage winning this thing. I don't. I don't see how anyone could uh, could debate that. But some people did. DJ Z has a new thing. He tried it out at the uh, Lucha and Impact show, and it, it didn't really get over when I was there. But where he's saying DJ, and everyone says Z, and there's a horn, and burr, 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 when he does that. So the show I went to, he tried it a few times, did not get over, but it, it sounded like it did a little bit more this time around. It was good to see Desmond Xavier back in the impact ring because he wasn't at this set of tapings. Uh, yeah, without a doubt. Uh, it was a good presentation. You know, everybody got to get their shit in without a doubt. The Lucha Rules definitely put a better spin on it. I'm glad it wasn't a Brian Cage nomination. And I understand the reason for putting Brian Cage in there because if this was the premise, Brad Cage can do all the things that the X Division stars can do. I that's not completely true, but um, he damn sure can do a lot. He can damn sure do a lot of things that they do. Um, everybody get. I like the fact that they had uh, Trevor Lee, you know, picking a fight basically with Brian Cage as opposed to everybody else who's kind of you know try to shy away. I think that's good for Trevor Lee's character being you know the caveman. You know, he, he fears none. We all know that about Trevor Lee. I'm a Trevor Lee fan. I like the work that he does. I like the direction that he's given him. I believe he's earned everything that he's gotten in Impact Wrestling. Um, I like the fact that Desmond Xavier, uh, what was it, Phantasma, when Desmond was trying to uh, club him, club Brian Cage over the back, and um, he was like, get up there on the turn and get your ass up there you know, for some help. <laughs> yeah, you know, stuff like that. It gives... Um, it, it gives something else to to the match. You know, it, it, it shows a little desperation because we know what we're dealing with, but at the same time, we're not backing down. You know, they're showing that you've got resolve as opposed to just going out there and being monkey spot monkeys. Yeah, of course, it was a, a spot fest, which we expected, but it was done real tastefully, tactfully. And, and like I said, the X Division stars still looked good. And like I was really great, happy to see DJ Z back. Um, even though I knew Brian Cage was on win, I, like you said, I have no idea why anyone else would think that anyone else could have won that match or was going to win that match. But if anyone else would have, I'd like to have been DJ Z, being that he come back from injury and whatnot. I think that would have been a good story. But for, to be a match with no storyline and just to come out of nowhere, really, basically a week before the pay-per-view, it, it delivered well. I mean... It, it was good. Uh, there was one botch by Brian Cage where he tried to do a, a springboard uh, moonsault uh, where he slipped and he fell on his back, but he jumped right back up, delivered it, you know, cleanly and went on with the match. So no one that didn't take anything out the match just as well. It went smoothly. It was fast paced and it was good. And Brian Cage was not dragging anything down, but I don't think anybody expected him to. Yeah, I thought they found a creative way to make Cage look strong, but not at the expense of the X Division guys. I mean, they were able to get enough offense on him where at points it seemed believable that either any one of these guys could have won this match. So that's what I was happy about because with Brian Cage's inclusion in the match, it was kind of like, oh, you know, right away it was hard for me to believe that no one else but him was going to win, but I was like, I'd hate for him to just run through run through guys. And I thought the ending sequence, because at, at times it felt, you know, everyone got their stuff in, but at times it seemed like they were going at a super fast pace. I don't know if you guys caught this, but the setup where I forgot what Desmond Xavier, he was going for his hand spring kick type maneuver and where Cage caught him, he didn't get him correctly at first. So then he had a... a properly position him for uh, the drill claw 
and like I said, it, it didn't take anything away from the match, but they were just going so super fast, so some things didn't look as clean as others. But overall, it was a uh, one of the, my favorite matches on the card. There was definitely some rough spots, and it's very similar to Slammiversary of last year, where it, it just there was noticeably a lot of slips throughout the pay per view. Um, but I thought everyone covered up for him very well. There was even a point where Desmond Xavier kind of hopped on the second rope and he uh, slipped a little bit himself. But I totally agree. I was worried it was going to be Brian Cage running through the X Division and throwing them around and everything. And, you know, there there was a time where I think he was holding one of them and another one jumped off the top rope and caught them both. And that was really excellent. And Brian Cage should have won. And he did. So uh, pretty enjoyable match. After this, Allie is backstage with Mackenzie, and Allie is now taking, I think it's safe to say, taking the next step as her character. She delivered that promo very different than she's delivered anything in the past, and even her entrance was not her jumping around and, and being silly. Like, it had, you know, it had a, a dash of that, but it seemed like the Allie character is starting to kind of take that next step. The next match of the evening was Taya Valkyrie, versus Kiera Hogan and this was for the most part what people thought was not the best match in the world but one thing I want to throw out there real quick is that you know many people have said well it took away from the match when Tessa Blanchard showed up so Tessa Blanchard debuted I freaking popped like a mother sitting there in my chair I couldn't believe it um, a lot of people have said well it took away from the match I just want to make it clear the match was booked for Tessa Blanchard to debut. It was a random knockouts match. It wasn't so we could enjoy Kiera versus Taya. It was done strictly for that debut, and that was the purpose, and it served its purpose. But with that being said, Ro, what do you think about this knockouts match? Did you, I, think, I think it's safe to say we were all a little bit distracted, but I thought the match was a little bit clunky. And um, there was no real drama to it. But um, what, what were your thoughts? <laughs> well, kind of what you were just talking about, I did think her debut took away from the match only because I thought this match when originally advertised was just a way to get both these both girls on the card, but as well as give Taya a win so she can get some momentum back since the last time we seen her, she had lost her match against Rosemary the Demon Dance well, but like everyone else I was distracted too by um sorry her name's her name's eluding me what's her, what's her Tessa I'm sorry uh, when Tessa Blanchard arrived on the commentary I felt like it just took away only because you know she came right in I want to say the middle of the match and I thought maybe if she came towards the end it it would have been better just for the participants of all. But like you said, the match, it seemed like it was put on just for her debut. I just kind of thought like this match was there to help Taya kind of get a win since she was coming in from a loss with uh, Rosemary. But yeah, the the big takeaway was Tessa Blanchard debuting in Impact Wrestling. Um, this match went precisely the way that I thought it would. Um... It was served its purpose to raise Kira Hogan's stock by showing that she can, you know, she got some wrestling skills because it was most of this match was her dominating and her giving offense and to tie her to get a win to come off of the loss that she just took at, um, I guess, Alley at um, Impact versus Lucha on the ground, just as well as uh, Rosemary. Um, you're right. Um, I was one of the ones that said that. Um, Tessa Blanchard took away from the match. And then once um, BQ said what it was booked for, I was like, you know what, you're right, because that was also a thought of my mind. But like BQ, I popped. When Tessa Blanchard came and she appeared, and I liked the reaction that Dial Callis gave, uh, gave Lisa, uh, did I sign you and, and forget? I don't, that's something I think I remember. Yeah, I thought that was funny as hell. I thought that was cool. Um, Tessa Blanchard, it could easily. And I think she probably will be the face of the knockouts division. This is just incredible because I love the way the knockouts division has been overhauled and being rebuilt. Um, they've been getting in talent constantly. They got the rise partnership. And, of course, they needed a new face. We all know Ali, at least in my opinion, uh, Ali's not to that point. Will she one day? I can't say because 
I just don't think she has all the things that you need. You would need, in my opinion, someone that can carry a division would be uh, Tessa Blanchard, uh, Santana Garrett, or um, uh, these people with skill and also have like the attitude, the uh, the persona to 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 carry a division. Uh, someone like Rosemary, even Rosemary definitely could carry a division. But for a new era going in from here, this is a legendary third generation uh, wrestler that has really put in work in the Indies and uh, really done some good things. I mean, and no one can deny her that. Um, for the people that don't know Tessa Blanchard, they will know her. And she definitely uh, made a presence known at Redemption. You know, let, let her heel presence be known. And, you know, for good reason. Um, I'm excited. Like I said, I, I, I'm a big fan of the Knockouts division. I've been in for a long time. I was disappointed for quite a while, you know, when we had that really, really bad drop off. And I'm really excited going forward now with Tessa Blanchard, when I know there's no doubt in my mind that she's going to be heading this knockout division going forward. Good shout out to Santana Garrett out there. That's another one. God, I would like to see her part of the division. But I think she just likes what she does right now as far as uh, working, you know, wrestling around the world and everything. And she has a good uh, civilian job and everything. And um, yeah, that's another one I like to see. But Tessa. She she's in that top that top percentile of just uh, of, of stars uh, that are unsigned. Lord knows why it didn't really work out with uh, WWE. I, I have my you know I have my ideas on why it didn't, and it has nothing to do with her personality. I just think she's too similar to the Charlotte Flair character, and that's who they're going to freaking push. She's going to be the the Roman of their women, so. I'm, I'm just glad she's here. They reported that she was going to be at the tapings after Bound for Glory, and that didn't end up happening. She was actually in Ottawa, and I I feel like maybe because, you know, Mike Johnson and, and uh, who's ass face, uh, <laughs> Dave, Mel <laughs> Dave Meltzer, you know, put that information out there. They probably, you know, pulled back on it a little bit. So uh, it's great that uh, we see her here now. And she's she's an exceptional talent, and I think kind of what Rose said, you know, Taya did get the win, and it gave her a little bit of momentum. Taya, I mean, excuse me, Taya, but Tessa was amazing in the announce booth. I, I've watched that clip a few times. She was amazing, and um, just kind of like Charles said, if you if you don't know her uh, now, you're, you're going to know her. There was a segment with uh, kind of a feel good. <laughs> moment with pd williams and scott steiner backstage it actually thought was kind of funny x division title match was after this matt seidel versus pd williams now for me this wasn't really what i expected i kind of i don't want to say I expected a, a spot fest by any means because there was an actual story to this but i guess i expected a little bit more high flying and everything and they actually told the story the whole match that it was going to be the shooting star press versus the canadian destroyer and neither of those those moves ended the match. Ended up being kind of kind of a roll up. And Matt Seidel got the win. I I kind of thought he was going to win. I think Rowe thought he was going to win, and um, he he did win. I think storyline wise, it just makes sense going forward for um, him to be the guy. So Rowe, what did you think of this X Division title match? Because as we said in the the preview, usually the X Division title is on the line in some random ass match. And there was an actual storyline here. And it, it wasn't, you know, spotty. It was just a, a good storytelling. It lacked some kind of, it, it lacked a little bit of drama. It didn't, it didn't really have a big build because it, again, the story was that it's a Canadian destroyer versus a shooting star press. That didn't even come close to happening. But uh, what'd you think about it? Yeah, it did lack the drama. I thought the thing which was a positive and you guys let me know what you guys think. I think we got really got to see Seidel play up his heel persona in this match. You know, you've seen some aggression from his side, and I thought that was neat. And then on top of that, the finish that he used, because I've never really been a fan of heels using flashy finishers. I think, you know, once you decide to become a heel, you know, a lot of the high-flying maneuvers, you're supposed to tone it down because it's perceived as... You know, that's something that the baby faces do. So for Seidel to use a new maneuver, I think that'll help help him moving forward with his heel character. But yeah, it, it just lacked it lacked the uh, drama, you know, as for the storyline that has been built up. I feel like the payoff was just kind of this this match was 
your ordinary X Division match that you would see on Impact. I totally agree with Ro. It definitely felt like something that, you know, we'd see every day. It wasn't a bad match, but it was totally, definitely slower than what I expected it to be. But most times when we have one-on-one X Division matches, they're slower anyway, because it's still kind of hard to have a whole lot of speed and a lot of fluid movement and lots of spots with a one-on-one match. Um, I think what could have built drama more so is that storyline that they had. That, and I don't know why they didn't mention it until Redemption. It's the first person that Pete Williams had ever performed uh, the Canadian Destroyer on was Matt Seidel. I think they should have hit that point weeks ago. And I think they could have used that to build drama into this match that was that it was lacking. And I agree with the both of you all. I mean, what do you think about that, BQ? Don't you think that's something that they really could have incorporated beforehand? You too, Ro? Something they could have incorporated beforehand to build some drama? Absolutely. That wasn't even something I knew until they said something about it. So that could have been something that they incorporated with the storyline. Absolutely. Like, like, dude, you're getting hit with the Canadian Destroyer and... He did get hit with it, but he rolled out of the ring, kind of, and kind of did right. the, the the smart thing. But I agree that even though the the story was pretty decent with this, there's there's another story they they could have told with that. And then if if that angle with Josh Matthews would have would have got to that next level, then this could have been a lot bigger than uh than it really was. Yeah, for some reason, for the storyline they had, the payoff it just something was just missing. All right, so Matt Seidel gets the win. We'll see what's next for Matt Seidel. House of Hardcore match up next. This personally was my favorite match of the evening. I felt like the crowd, this was the closest thing we had seen to like the old TNA crowd. I mean, they were really, really into this match. And I was a little concerned at first that you were taking a a wonderful feud, the best feud in wrestling in my opinion, and making it a multi-man match with Tommy Dreamer who just kind of shows up out of nowhere. But Roe kind of called it, he... Tommy Dreamer was there to take the pin and the match overall as far as a good hardcore match I thought was excellent sometimes they bring out the trash can lids and all that stuff and it's just there's not really much to it but this match um, I, I, I thought it was amazing I loved it I loved every moment of it and then you got the end of the match where Eddie kind of gets his they lose but he still finds a way to kind of get some comeuppance. And I think that's kind of smart. I don't know if they're going to continue this feud or not, because at this point it's pointless. What, just so Eddie can pin his shoulders to the mat? He's already done that before. So the way that this was booked was actually quite excellent because it keeps OVE looking strong in getting the win. Neither Eddie or Moose take the loss. Eddie still attacks Sammy after the match, leaves him bloody, and then you've got his wife that comes down. And when she came running down, I knew exactly what was going to happen. What I would have liked to have seen, and maybe they just felt it was too dangerous, is I wish after he was bloody that he would have grabbed the bat instead of the kendo stick and took out the Chris brothers with the bat. You know, do do like a, I call it like a Triple H sledgehammer thing. You know, put your hand at the end of it, hit him in the gut or something like that. And then do a very similar spot with... Alicia. Um, I mean, she is a trained wrestler, so I'm not saying hit her in the face with the bat, but you can, you, there's that p- protected bat strike that could have, could have told us a, a slightly better story, in my opinion. Maybe they thought it was too dangerous to do that, but um, I thought, uh, I thought the whole presentation from start to finish was A plus. What do you got on this one, Charles? Oh, man, I couldn't agree more, you know, because a lot of the time, we get these hardcore matches, whatever you want to call them, whether it be hard, House of Hardcore, Hardcore Extreme, or whatever label you want to put on it, where it's just overdone. You got flaming, um, flaming tables, and and you know you're just overdoing things. Yeah, barbed wire matches, uh, barbed wire bats, but you're not just going and blooding up everybody and tearing skin. And it was not too much. It wasn't. Everybody dished out the punishment. The crowd, like you said, it was electric. It, um, one thing I hate to see is when Moose comes out for impact and 40%, maybe 30% of the people are participating with the Moose chant. That was not the case. You know, people were really into him. That's that's really a big selling point for impact, uh, in my opinion, is because Moose is, Moose is one of the top faces and he's really popular. And he has like this worldwide appeal 
because if, if you if you notice anywhere outside of the impact zone in Orlando, everybody's into it. Everybody's into the Moose Chance and its entrance, into the Moose Chance during the match and everything in the impact zone in Orlando, Florida. It's a lot different. Good thing that the crowd was different from your original, you know, your normal impact crowd in Orlando, Florida. So uh, it was great that the crowd was into it. It was like having an ECW crowd. They even chatted, started chatting, chatting ECW, you know. Um, Tommy Dreamer definitely served his purpose. Ro, you were hit, you were right on the money with that. Come in, take the pin. He was the only person that really could take the pin and and be acceptable, you know, because no one needed to make needed to be made to look weak in that match because everybody kind of had their momentum going. Um, I expect Mush, uh, excuse me, Moose to be getting the push, so I could definitely couldn't see him being pinned. Ove and um. Sammy Callahan, in my opinion, right now, Sammy Callahan is like the hottest thing. He's like the hottest act in Impact right now, really in wrestling, because Impact and he himself really turned a bad situation into some real good heat and storyline action. And it just wouldn't have been right for them to take the loss. So just like you said, BQ, the way that it was carried out, the win, um, Eddie Edwards getting his in. I mean, it, it just everything kept the crowd into it. It kept the viewer into it, and it was all done in good taste. I mean, it was it was incredible. It was one of the best hardcore matches I've seen in a long time. It was one of the most exciting matches, especially for a pay per view I've seen in a long time. It, it was really good in in all aspects. I, I totally enjoyed. It. Big, really big thumbs up for me. Yeah, I thought this was excellent. Um, the thing that I loved the most was everyone had an opportunity in this match to kind of get their their stuff in, so to speak. And my favorite spot, and another thing too, before I get into my favorite spot, they didn't do anything too crazy. Like I know in the preview show I was talking about, hopefully they don't take any unnecessary bumps, and I didn't see any here that I could recall. But my favorite a spot just because of the timing of everything was where Moose, I forgot what he was going for, but then Jake Chris uh, came in for the cutter. Oh, okay. Moose was going for a splash. They had a uh, Dave Chris laid out on the table and then Jake Chris leaps over and uh, hits Moose with a cutter. I thought that was excellent. And then just let alone too, because the timing of that, you know, if you're off by one, one thing, then that's it. But the ending sequence, having Tommy Dreamer take the pin, I thought that was good just because I thought OVE needed the win more so than Eddie Edwards, Moose, and Tommy Dreamer. And then outside of that, just the continuance of the feud between Eddie Edwards and Sammy Callahan, they've really found ways to extend this feud. And when you you know you think back to this all stemmed from an accident that they could have easily you know, downplayed and moved forward, but they've carried on and been able to find more and more. Now we enter the next chapter of this feud where, you know, Eddie has snapped to the point where he, you know, attacked his his wife. So it has me interested to see what happens next between not only just Eddie Edwards and Callahan, but as far as uh, the part that the Chris brothers play as well. This is storytelling that no other wrestling promotion or anything has been able to match with this feud right now. And this is this is one of the things that, the naysayers of impact and, and the, you know, the guys like bully Ray was, Oh, the pay-per-view was okay. This is the thing. This is the type of thing that they overlook. They, they overlook the genius of finding a way to keep one team strong yet kind of closing the chapter for Eddie and then transitioning into a brand new storyline or just kind of a brand new wrinkle in things with Alicia. I mean, it was just done to perfection. And if, if, that was over people's heads. Uh, that really sucks. I got to ask you, bro. Are, are you going to tell me that you know the difference between Dave and Jake Chris, but you get Santana and Ortiz confused? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think with them, just because the the hair color, I've, you know, for the longest following LAX, when they announced him, I'm like, who's who? I've, <laughs> I've never, I've never, I've never known till till now, which is sad. But, you know, when I hear them, and I, I guess I never probably paid attention to when one of them's in the ring and they're calling them by their name, but I, I, I don't know why I never knew which one was which. But with the Chris brothers, I always knew Jake was the blonde one who uh, wears that sweater where he used to wear that little half sweater thing. And then I remember Dave, but yeah. <laughs> I have no idea which one's which with the, with the Chris brothers. I'm not going to lie. So 
After this, we get the knockouts title match. Ali defends against Sue Young. Braxton Sutter is r at ringside. They never really... We, we don't really know what the story is between Braxton and Sue Young, but he's doing a really good job of playing a comedic heel without being uh, too cheesy. I think what he's doing is is funny, and he's he's delivering at what his role is supposed to be right now. And it, it's kind of funny in the night of, of, of kind of botches and everything. You know, there was the angle where Ali was supposed to slap him, and he was supposed to catch it, and even that wasn't very smooth. But, um, you know, they played it off, and then Ali slaps him. And overall, the match was, I, I liked it, um, probably a little bit better than some of the other ma alley matches we see. I'm personally just a, such a huge fan of Sue Young. Like, uh, I've said it a few times, her presentation and music and, and, and everything is just next level. Uh, so Allie gets the win, and again, she kind of wins with a roll-up too. This was when I, Ro and I had said, you know, we think Allie's going to s snap maybe and get herself disqualified in this one. Well, we're not big fans of DQ finishes at a pay-per-view, but I thought it may, would have made sense here. But Ali still took that next step without having to do that. Again, it was kind of the pre-match promo. It was the ring entrance and even yelling at Braxton Sutter before the match. She, she really looked like she took that next step. So I enjoyed the match a little bit more than probably a normal Ali match just because I, I started seeing the evolution. I was a little shocked that Su Young took the loss. Um, it was by roll up, so I feel like roll ups protect you a little bit more than losing to someone's finisher. And with this pay per view, they didn't rely on finishers so much, as, which is something other companies do for every single match. It's got to be finisher, got to be a finisher. Impact didn't quite do that so much with all this. Um, I'm a little concerned where the Su Young character goes from here because she got a title match so early. Um, she's got a 50 50 record now. And she was involved in the angle with Braxton after the match, which I thought was comedic goal that he was uh, proposing to her. But then it almost put Sue Young in a bit of a co comedy angle too, just just a little bit. But of course she hits Braxton with the mist. So we'll see what happens there. Ro, what you think about the knockouts title match? You know, I know in the preview we had stated you know, they had booked themselves in the corner because, you know, it's too soon for Ali to drop it, the knockouts championship. And you don't want to give Sue Young her first loss already after this being pretty much her second match. So, yeah, technically her second match in Impact. It was a, a fluky win if you wanted to go that route. I was concerned towards the end of the match, a post-match angle where having Sue Young involved with the whole Braxton proposal and her attacking him. I mean, I thought that was cool that because I, I wondered when she had pulled out the glove, what the glove was for. And I guess she's using that as the claw. So she uses the same thing mandible. that uh, Mick Foley used. Yeah, mandible. yeah, mandible claw. So um, I think moving forward, I think she'll be all right. I do think their feud is going to continue. But I would just be concerned moving forward. What are they going to do with her? Because if they have her continue the feud with Ali, there's only one or two ways that it can go and if you have her keep losing the alley then you know it, it you know it might be hard to rehabilitate her down the road and then it's too soon it'd probably be too soon to put the knockouts championship on her so um we just got to see how it plays out but i thought i'm glad they went this direction instead of doing a uh no dq i mean uh, sorry not no dq instead of doing a dq or a count out some type of false finish and this is something again where i say the naysayers it's completely over their head to where, yes, Sue Young loses, but she kind of loses by a fluky roll-up and then kind of leaves standing tall with her music playing afterwards. So those are the little things that Demore and, and um, Don Callis are, are doing that maybe to the average wrestling fan, it's over your head, but it, it's, a, it's a way of reminding us, hey, Sue Young is still a threat, though. What do you got on this one, Charles? Hey, this... This looks like a grand case of good old, old style booking. Like you all said, the roll up makes it to where maybe it's a kind of a fluke or ordeal. And I was concerned because I had the exact same concern that you guys had. It's like Sue Young is new to the company. She's a heel. She has a pretty, you know, great persona. She has one of those characters, a persona that's just like made for, for, for TV, for when it comes to professional wrestling on a global scale. It's made for TV. Simple and plain. So it's not someone that you want to have losing a lot of matches in the beginning because you wanted to get over. And I've heard you say on um, 
um, when Sue Young came to the uh, company and in, on in the Impact Lounge BQ, that um, that type of heel isn't really received by the crowd because she's an old style heel that is there to not get cheer. She's not a cool heel. She's not that one that's going to have people cheer for her and things like that. So with her being the type of heel that she is, you know, she's not going to get that 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 hoorah that other heels will get. So you don't want her taking loss after loss. And I think projecting her into that world title match so early coming into the um, into impact, it was kind of like a death sentence. It could be because you had to know that she was going to take the loss. But the the roll up was great. And then like old style booking, when you have someone, especially heels, that has a manager and for some reason or another, they break up with a manager normally dealing with dysfunction. What does that heel do? They go to the next step. They take a step uh, to a higher level and do something and they break out in some kind of way. And I believe it's going to be the exact same thing with Sue Young. I don't believe this dude is over with, especially with the way that it ended. And it seems like she's going to part ways with uh, with Braxton Sutter. Like you, I do like, we know that Braxton Sutter has taken on this heel role. Um, I believe it all started at BCW. Uh, I mean, excuse me, one not only March breakdown when he really came out and showed his heel presence, his heel role. Um, I'm glad that he has the place and impact right now. I don't know where they go with him from here, but I definitely see Sue Young taking the next step and really letting, letting her presence be known. So I do like it in this case. To me, it was like your normal match. Um, I do like the fact, like BQ said, that they didn't just rely on, on finishers because that is something that is so cliche. It happens all the time, especially... And, you know, the other brand, you know, and um, I'm, I, I like the way that it ended. I like what it has us waiting for, what we're looking forward to more than anything. I think I like what it has me anticipating. I want to say I thought the commentary was really enjoyable for the pay-per-view and Don Callis added a wrinkle to it that we haven't heard on impact in a while. And even, even probably in wrestling in a while, unless you're someone that watches new Japan, but we don't really got that good heel commentator in wrestling. You know, some other companies got heel commentators, but they still flip flop. Josh Matthews flip flops, but, but he played a really good heel. And, uh, the one that really made me laugh was when, um, Josh was like, Allie's got her own bunny section. And, and Don Callis is like, what a bunch of idiots <laughs> 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 that, that kind of cracked me up because we just haven't gotten that kind of heel color commentary commentator in the longest time so uh, I thought he was killing it and it seems like that is the commentary team going forward what did you do you guys agree that these uh new titles are pretty gorgeous <laughs> I agree they are very nice I like that the uh the style of the knockouts belts because if you notice that um when it comes to 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 female championship belts so there's kind of like a different shape to it because the guy gets to kind of give it like a feminine look or feel. I like the diamond shape that it has. It's not like a really big gregarious belt full of metal. I think it's perfect for, you know, for the um, knockouts division, the tag team belts. They look nice, not big and gaudy. Um, the world, and then they got the silver tone and then they made the world championship set apart from all the other championships by making it gold, by making it, giving it an old style circular look. Um, and it looked, they look good to me. Uh, they put the, the owls on each and every one of them, the X division belt, tag team knockouts. I think they, they could look great to me. I think it was a big improvement from, uh, the global force, supposed new belts, because to me, the old, the, those last belts, the impact grand champ, uh, titles that came out when the whole merger supposed to happen, just looked like the old GFW belts. Anyway, so right, and I didn't, I didn't think those were bad belts. It was just really the world title that looked absolutely terrible. I, I've been gushing over that knockouts title. I I think it's gorgeous. That uh, to me is just the coolest design. Uh, there was a troll on the Impact uh, Facebook that was like, all the titles look the same, and I, it was some like you know WWE troll. And I was like, I was like, are you kidding? They literally have the same exact titles on on WWE for the women and the men, like. Are you, are you? This is really where you're going with it. This, this is what you want to complain about today, and uh, try to put impact down. But I was really glad that they kept a really similar X division uh, style. There was no reason to redesign that one because that was already a new design, 
it, you know, just had the GFW on it, but it was, it was a new design because X division is an impact title. It's not like the next gen title. They took that and did something with it. So, uh, I think they just did a great job with all of them. what do you think about the belts row? Yeah, I thought the knockouts title stood out the most for me just because it said knockouts. If you think about the previous titles, it would actually say women's, but that knockouts title to me, just as a fan, I'm looking at it, the world title and the knockouts title in my eyes are the two top belts in the company. And just the way that they designed the knockouts title, it just stuck out to me. I mean, the rest of them, you know, the X division, I, I like that they kind of kept a similar design because I thought it was fine to begin with as well as the tag but and then the world looks great as well but that knockouts title man that just it, they really made it uh, really put in a, a good effort to make that look great and that reflects the division because that's something that this company and even even in its times during its downfalls um, they've always try to keep the knockouts division relevant so kudos to them yeah it's a really classy title and uh, you know again like i i even thought the old one looked okay I, I really i've always said the global force titles were were really classy too it was it was just the whole plates over it everything and you know um they announced that july 22nd this is i, I don't remember the last time they've actually announced the next pay-per-view at a pay-per-view but I, I mean, I guess because the pay-per-views are so spread apart now, but they announced July 22nd in Toronto, which is great wrestling town. Uh, that's where Slammiversary will be held. I don't remember the exact name of the uh, venue, but it holds over 3,000 people. So it's, this is interesting to see. We can get back to that, you know, uh, early 2000s where they were able to put 3,000 people in a in a venue for Slammiversary or Bound for Glory. So this is going to be interesting to see if, they can pull it off, and I, I really hope that they can. Main event in the evening was the Impact World Title match, Austin Aries versus Pentagon versus Phoenix, and this was the big shocker of the evening. I think most people felt that Austin Aries was going to win. I I think I thought he was going to win. I, I I was like, there's no way Pentagon is winning two ma two of these three way matches in a row with these guys, and sure as hell. He wins the match, and he is the new champion. It was probably the match of the night, uh, or, or I don't know. It depends on what you what you like, but for many people, it was definitely it, definitely the match of the night. It's definitely one of the top two or three, however you want to look at it. But the great, great, the, the three together work very well together, and they even told the story. They went through the for the double super kick early, the one that took him out of the match in the Impact versus Lucha Underground show, and. Um, the crowd definitely likes Pentagon, and this was crazy because this was the most buzzworthy title change that Impact has done in a very, very long time. This was something that's like, holy crap. Now, I haven't looked at the spoilers. I don't want to look at the spoilers, but I've said it's in their best interest to keep the title on Pentagon through the tapings because if, if he drops it during the tapings and the spoilers get out there. Now people don't have a reason to tune in this Thursday, let alone th th through that the rest set of tapings. So they're trying to say since the Pentagon era, let's let's roll with this a little bit because this is this is buzzworthy stuff. I actually thought if anyone was going to win, it was going to be Phoenix, but it definitely wouldn't have been wouldn't have been the same buzz that Pentagon got as winning. So title comes off Austin Aries for a little bit. And I believe Austin Aries is not going to be super featured in this set of tapings. I think he was just doing the first couple days. So, uh, you know, that means that for the first month of tapings, he'll, he'll be involved. And then uh, kind of taking a break and doing his thing. And that's good because we should get Austin Aries in, in doses. Charles, what do you got on this main event here uh, and the title change, the surprising title change? Wow. Let me tell you something. I haven't marked out so bad mainly because i was so surprised my uh one of my friends came in while um we were watching it, my lady and i and the way they were looking at me when 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 there was that one two three hit when he did the um what is it not the gory driver the um what is this finish the moon card again bq um man but definitely when he did the double gory um, driver, I believe it's called. Yeah, and and pinned because I just knew there was no way that Austin was going to kick out. But I'm like, there's no way that he's going to drop this title either. But when he counted three, all I could say was, "Oh my god!" 
oh my god and they they were looking at me like has he gone crazy i said man the internet is going to go ablaze i said this was incredible because the match was already just like great you know very fluid uh, there was a box of course by, by phoenix it's that same rope that had been giving problems the whole time but he turned into an incredible um corkscrew but it's definitely uh, oh and one of the best moves when um Austin Aries ran to the ropes, came back to the other side. Pentagon was on the outside. Phoenix tossed him over his head, and Austin Aries turned it into a hurricanrana on Pentagon Jr. When he landed to him, on him after he got tossed over uh, Phoenix's head, that was great. The crowd was really into it. They were spot on with their uh, spots, all their moves. It didn't look choreographed. I mean, it was really, really, really main event worthy because they really had to hit this one hard after the whole El Patron thing. You know, um, like you, I expected El Patron to win. Um, and then I come to find out that he was booked to win, you know, through the internet and whatnot. So I wasn't wrong there. But there's no way I saw Pentagon, a Lucha Underground wrestler, especially just like you said, for the very same reason that you said he, he, that Austin Aries lost at uh, Lucha Underground versus uh, Impact Wrestling. And it was the right thing to do, just being honest. Because... The purpose was to bring back those fans, and you got this partnership with Lucha Underground, and people were really iffy about it, didn't know, know how strong it was, but this shows that that relationship is pretty damn strong, does it not? Absolutely. You know, and just like you said, they need to ride this wave. As much as I thought it wouldn't happen, it was really the right thing to do. Because Pentagon Jr. is world-renowned. I don't give a damn if you're in Australia, if you're in the United Kingdom, if you're in America, if you're in Mexico. He is loved worldwide. And that's something that someone that you want to be able to carry the back, and you will be able to bring fans. People were saying that we needed someone big to bring in, aside from El Patron, even before El Patron, such as Rey Mysterio. And then when El Patron left, so then maybe we need to bring in Swagger. Maybe we need to bring in this person, that person. But he's really been around the whole time, and the evidence, his proof is in the pudding right there. Pentagon Jr. is that person right now that could carry us and, you know, carry that impact banner and bring more eyes and bring more um, more accolades to, to the brand that we have. Row here, the only thing I want them to, I hope that they avoid is is what Ring of Honor has with New Japan, where it seems like the Ring of Honor talent gets fed to the New Japan talent quite a bit. Now, with this being said, I probably haven't watched Ring of Honor in a year. I've said it a hundred times on my channel. I, there was a pay-per-view I was watching, and it was just so spotty and um, full of cool, cool heels and near falls and super finishers. I was like, I'm done. Um, but that's a complaint I've, I've continued to see on this day. To this day, on the internet, is uh, you know, New Japan is carrying the promotion. We we want to get away from that. We we definitely don't want the any lucha guys to come in and um, you know for the in all fairness you know Phantasma's not running Impact Wrestling by any stretch no nope. um, mm -mm. you know Ty is booked strong um, Brian Cage is booked strong but but those guys you you don't really look at them and you know Johnny Impact you don't really look at them and think oh that that's lucha underground talent you you feel like those are guys you know interpromotional guys that they're they're just working for two companies same with Sammy Callahan but definitely the wrestlers linked to Lucha Underground have, have been pretty strong for the most part. We just don't want them to to run the company, and we definitely don't want an invasion angle because uh, mm -hmm. Impact will be the bad guys in that case, <laughs> I can assure you. Yep, yep. Um, so, Ro, what do you got on uh, main event? Um, I was surprised that they did the title change, and then let alone that it was Aries eating the pin because – I had thought if they did go the route of the title change, they were going to have uh, one of the two pin the other. And then that way you could have Aries talk about, hey, I wasn't pinned. You know, something that we commonly see in triple threat matches where the champion loses but wasn't pinned. So I was just surprised that he got the pin. But, yeah, you know, yeah, I guess it's good. It gives the company some publicity as far as the uh, Pentagon Jr. and being the impact world champion as well as being lucha ground ah, i'm sorry lucha underground champion so we just got to see where they go go from here and like you guys both alluded to you know the one thing i hope and i don't think it's going to be like that but hopefully they're not 
kind of pandering to them were at the expense of impact guys you know the goal the one thing i would like to see is maybe some of the talent on the impact roster that's doesn't really have anything to do maybe they can pair them with some of the lucha people and uh you know have tag teams because that's one one thing that the company needs right now or as, as well as you know maybe bring some some of their women talent to compete with the knockouts you know use those partnerships in those ways it doesn't necessarily have to be like hey we're gonna we're gonna put your talent over at the expense of, expense of ours let's work together and build something like that but with that said um it was surprising. It's one of those things. And that's the one thing that you like as a fan. You know, when we do previews, yeah, you know, we're just speculating what we think is going to happen. But it's always good to be surprised. So I was thoroughly surprised. So now I'm – and this is my first time seeing Pentagon Jr. So now I'm going to have the opportunity to catch him more now that he's Impact World Champion. I think the pay-per-view was a solid B, B+. I just, I just thought they um, put a lot of effort forward and – they, I don't know. Like I said earlier, I think there was a lot of storytelling and story progression here that I think went over a lot of people's heads, even even the so-called experts. And I think if they would stop and look at it from that angle, they'd be like, man, Redemption, Redemption did the damn thing. So I think it did what a pay-per-view is supposed to do. It, it, it has us excited to watch Impact coming up, you know, and that that's how it should be. Um you know, and I, I'm not trying to bring WWE up, WWE up here, but, you know, I know that with WrestleMania, it ended with uh, Brock winning. And no one was like, okay, can't wait to turn on tomorrow to see what the fuck happens with this. People turn it on for the surprises that they didn't know they're going to get. But I know um, a lot of their pay-per-views, they, they end with something predictable. And they're, they're not, it's not like a cliffhanger to say, okay, tu- tune in Monday, tune in Tuesday. Like, this actually delivered that like wow what's what's next um what are they gonna do with these tag team titles what's gonna happen with pentagon what's the next step for ally we saw some progression from her what's the next step with that what's gonna happen with eddie and alicia like there were there was actually cliffhangers that they were giving us and again this is stuff i think went over a lot of people's heads who claim to be wrestling experts and uh overall i thought the show kicked ass so um we're going to wrap it up. Charles, you got anything, uh, any closing comments on the Rede- Redemption show? Hey, all I can say is you pretty much said everything that I think I could have said, man. Definitely a solid B plus. Cliffhangers galore to where you continue wanting to watch and see what's going on. Genuine interest. I mean, it was just a really well put together pay-per-view between the two companies because, you know, it was definitely a, a joint venture with Impact of Lucha on the ground. Um, it, it was it was great. I just hope to continue to see good stuff like this going forward. Yeah, I thought with the buildup that they devoted to this pay-per-view, the pay-per-view delivered. And not only that, with them advertising Slammiversary, giving us a date already, I think the build towards Slammiversary is going to be even better. And as a, as a fan, I mean, you're looking forward to leading up, not only leading up to that, but Impact – you know, not only this upcoming Thursday, but moving forward. I mean, some big things are coming. This new regime has really, really clicked and has built consistency, and that's all we could ask for as fans. So, yeah, that's going to do it for our review this week. Thanks for listening, folks, or not this week, but for this uh, pay-per-view. And we'll be, uh, of course, reviewing everything Impact is doing going forward. Definitely check out for Charles in the future regarding Twitch and uh, One Night Only, Ro and Adam doing the Impact reviews, and Ro, of course, doing the Explosion reviews. And uh, I will be dropping the news, ru- excuse me, news, reviews, rumors, interviews, whatever it is that uh, I do these days for, for the uh, Impact Lounge, but lots of good things coming up. Thanks for listening, folks, and we will talk to you next time. Peace.